All right, guys, today we're going to be talking about big uh, traditional land empires, primarily, in the um, era of um, beginning European dominance and industrialization. And we're going to see that these big empires have very um, similar uh, issues that they have to deal with, and they're also going to have similar ways of dealing with those issues. We're going to focus primarily um, and very heavily on the Ottomans and one of their... Um, breakaway nation states, uh, Egypt, and uh, we'll have just a little bit of discussion about China and Japan since those will be the primary um, areas of comparison that we'll work with in class. Okay, so we're going to first talk about factors of change, and I think uh, this cartoon is a perfect example of um, what factors are beginning to be altered in the globe of this time period uh, of about 1800 to uh, 1914, right when World War I begins. Um, here in this cartoon you see France, who's this little guy on the left, and Britain, and um, as empires they are carving up and uh, plating the world for themselves. So this is the primary driver of change in the period. Uh, this is the first time when Europe really becomes um, a full-fledged uh, factor in uh, global politics and things begin to happen because of European instigation. So um, we'll be looking at that over the course of this PowerPoint. Okay, um, of course other than uh, Europeans desire to um, exploit and uh, create hegemony for themselves in the globe, you've got this new emerging idea of nationalism and it is definitely on the rise in this period and we're going to talk about what that means these are just um, things I pulled out of um, like Webster's Dictionary online. So nationalism, according to the dictionaries, a feeling that people have of being loyal to and proud of their country, or a desire, this is an important one, so um, stick a little star beside it, says a desire by a large group of people, such as people who share the same culture, history, language, etc., to form a separate and independent nation of their own. And this is going to be a huge driver of... Um, history in this time period. People are going to want to create a state of their own. And um, I hope that you can see that this will be a huge problem for areas that have um, like traditional big empire feel. So if you're a big empire and you've got um, and you've got let's see, like a bunch of different ethnic groups, a bunch of different linguistic groups in your state, those people's desire to form a separate and independent nation is going to cause a huge problem for you because they will want to break away. And you'll see all kinds of stuff like that going down um, in this time period. And um, there's been a lot of theorizing about nationalism, but I really want you to focus on this word because um, it is going to be important right up through our own time period. Um, and a lot of people would argue that it is the number one... Um, sort of ideology that drives um, the modern world. So um, I've given you a couple of definitions here. First, uh, feeling connected to the nation. And I put that in quotes. Uh, by language, religion, culture, ethnicity, common borders, etc. Um, and I put it in quotes because it really is an imagined community. Um, you don't have any real contact with um, all the members of this community aka the nation. However, you envision yourselves as being bonded to and a part of one entity, the nation. And that idea of an imagined community is um, a really a really potent one. And again, nationalism is, in the opinion of a lot of people, the primary driving force from um, about, I don't know, 1800 on through to today. Um, it's also the idea of being connected to the nation. And it is more than being, uh, as we saw in the past, subjected to the reign of a common ruler. So it isn't just that uh, everybody who is American um, is, um, you know, um, under the um, direction of President Obama. There's a lot more to being American than just having a common uh, leader. So, um, and hopefully... You guys can distinguish this idea of nationalism from patriotism. So um, 
I think one of the strongest ways to understand what a word means is to talk about what it, uh, things that are thought to be similar to it, but which are definitely distinct. So I'd like you to think about that word patriotism just on your own time and think about how nationalism is uh, different from patriotism. So the other big driver of change is going to be industrialization. According to Strayer in the chapter that you read, Europe had new motives and new means to expand their power. So new motives and new means. So new uh, things that they wanted and new ways to get what they wanted. First, the Industrial Revolution uh, made Europe really uh, need raw materials, and they had a huge desire for markets to sell those mass-produced goods in. And they also had um, a surplus of population. And we're going to see a ton of migration out to areas like um, the United States, Latin America, Australia, um, in the case of Russia, across Siberia. Um, you also see the growth of um, mass nationalism in Europe, which will make imperialism really popular, according to Strayer. So once you're sort of bound together in this group called the nation, you of course want your nation to be um, the best. And I think it's kind of uh, interesting to think about this, uh, given the Olympics, right? The Olympics is supposed to be um, the expression of, um, I don't know, global togetherness and um, international camaraderie. But at the same time, um, you know, my phone gives me a daily update of the medal count. And um, if you head over into Mr. Walsh's room, they'll tell you how many um, medals Canada's got, right? So you've got this idea of like wanting your nation to be the best and perhaps to exert control over other nations at the same time as um, in the Olympics, you're supposed to have that feeling of like um, international um, camaraderie. And then um, in the industrial age, this is the new means, the new ways of getting those things that they want. Um, they've got steamships, they've got the underwater telegraph, quinine. I'd like you to write a note out beside quinine. Quinine is um, a drug and it is going to be hugely important um, as Europeans move into tropical environments, it helps to decrease the symptoms of malaria. It doesn't cure malaria, but it makes it possible for Europeans to move into tropical climates. So jot that note out to the side. Before the invention of quinine, um, Europeans are going to make very little headway in um, tropical areas. After the invention, um, you'll notice that uh, Africa, for example, is very quickly um, subjugated, conquered, carved up by Europeans, um, and imperialized. And of course, military power, breech-loading rifles, and then machine guns will make um, Europe a fairly unstoppable force militarily. There are examples of Europe being uh, beaten during the era of imperialism that we'll talk about next. However, um, it's kind of overwhelming if you are not using modern weapons to go up against um, for example, the early machine gun, um, which was invented as of the uh, 1880s. All right, there are two words that I wanna discuss briefly before we go further into this lecture. They are westernization and modernization. And pretty much both of those terms uh, are mostly referring to industrialization. Um, all nations obviously will want the power uh, that comes with industrialization and the ability to, to at the minimum, to defend themselves um, from other nations that are already industrialized. Um, so when people are going to talk about becoming modernized, what they're going to mean is, hey, let's industrialize. And in most cases, they will want to do this in the military. So I want you to put a little, uh, few underlines under military might um, and maybe a little star beside it. Um, Primarily, people just don't want to be trampled on, and they realize that they're going to have to industrialize if they're going to get that. Um, also, some nations will want all of the things that come with what is called westernization. And this definitely refers to industrialization, but it means to become more western, aka like Europe. And broadly speaking, when people refer to westernization, what they mean is they want the government structure, for example, um, a constitutional government, even in Europe where monarchs still remained, for example, Great Britain, um, there was a, a parliamentary system with uh, citizen, popu uh, citizen um, 
participation in that government. They wanted a Western educational system. They wanted a free press. So um, nations will sort of um, fall somewhere along this big spectrum of wanting to fully adopt what's called Westernization and just simply wanting a military that can resist uh, other nations that are industrialized. And I want you to think about some of the problems that would come with, quote, becoming Western or, quote, becoming modern. Uh, and many of those problems are going to be simply because um, European culture will, in many ways, supplant or replace the culture of the people who are trying to, quote, modernize. So um, a lot of people disagreed with or did not want modernization and westernization, and that is still the case today because they view it as a loss of their own culture and their own national identity. And national identity is going to be a huge force in the modern world, just like national uh, nationalism, which, you know, those two are very closely tied together. So traditional empires like China and like the Ottomans are going to struggle to redefine themselves in an era which is highly nationalistic. Um, I want you to check out this um, cartoon right here. This is a very famous cartoon from the era. Here you've got China, which is depicted as of course, the emblem of China still today, a dragon, and it's helpfully labeled for you. Very nice. So we know that's China. We've got um, Japan with a cool samurai sword in his mouth. This huge bear, which of course always symbolizes Russia. The bear is always Russia. Um, you've got this lion. This lion is always going to be Britain. you got this little rooster. That's France. You've got this, um, I don't even know what that is, an eagle, I guess, I think. Uh, that's Germany. And over here, you've got the bald eagle. Of course, you know who that is. Uh, in case you don't, here's a, you know, stars and stripes sash that he's wearing. And of course, hopefully you can figure out what they're doing is sort of attacking this dead carcass of a nation. Um, and they're all swarming over it. And hopefully uh, they're going to pick off a piece of it for themselves. Traditional empires are um, multinational, as we talked about, multi-ethnic, multilinguistic, multi-religious. In an era of nationalism, when everybody living within the borders of the nation is supposed to have uh, similar characteristics, those traditional empires are going to have a really hard time holding themselves together. Even today, if you look at a uh, nation state like the modern nation state of Russia, there are uh, elements within the Russian state that are um, in active rebellion against the um, nation state because they're, uh, they have an they have a, um, identity of their own. So, for example, um, the region of Dagestan is um, currently in unrest in Russia, um, Chechnya. Um, so there are various areas within Russia, and um, my class has talked about it in class just a little bit. But there are various areas within Russia that have a uh, identity of their own. Maybe they have their own religion or their own uh, ethnic group or their own linguistic group um, or their own cultural background, and they want to form a nation of their own. And that can be a huge problem because if you have a large, very large um, land mass, then um, one of the issues is going to be to, of course, keep all those diverse areas um, subjected under the rule of one nation state. Um, and what you'll find often is that those nation states try to make the smaller sort of sub-national groups within their nation state um, homogenous with the main nation state group. And that's very much been the policy of Russia. Um, Schreer talked about that in the last chapter, I think. Um, that's very much been the policy of Russia um, throughout their history. Um, they um, focused on policies of russification, so making the um, subset populations of their large, large nation state more like the dominant um, ethnic, linguistic, or religious group of that nation. So that's one way to sort of get over the bump of having all these different groups within you is to sort of try to make everybody uh, like the dominant group. Um, one really clever thing that the United States has done, this is just sort of a sideline, one of the really clever things that the U.S. has done is sort of define ourselves as a melting pot. So one of the thing that, things that defines being American, of course, is um, being diverse. So uh, that's been a really clever strategy employed by the United States to uh, keep 
the various groups uh, within the nation state um, happy as being a member of that nation state because uh, we're sort of defined as a melting pot of uh, various groups. So, okay, let's talk about the Ottoman Empire in particular. Um, at the time, from about 1800 on, the Ottoman Empire was known as the sick man of Europe. It's technically ruled by the Sultan in Istanbul, just like um, just like it was back in the heyday of the Ottoman Empire. For example, under Suleiman the Magnificent in the 15 and 1600s, um, they kind of reached their height in the uh, 1680s, 1690s, and after 1700, we start to see some decline. Um, and as the central government declines in power, of course. Various outlying areas, rulers, view this as an opening to be able to um, exert their own will. And so what happens is the Ottoman Empire becomes decentralized and they have a lot of independent rulers that technically owe allegiance to the Sultan in Istanbul, but in reality are doing their own thing. Again, the Ottomans are multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic, multi-religious. Uh, we've talked about this before. That's one of the hallmarks of the Ottoman Empire is that they created systems um, in which um, their various um, groups could um, feel free and have some of their own power. For example, the millet system is the one that we talked about explicitly in class, where um, various religious groups could follow their own uh, religious laws um, as long as they, of course, gave allegiance to the sultan. But in an era of increasing nationalism based on those unifying factors, like having a common ethnicity, having a common language, having a common religion, the Ottoman Empire is going to have huge problems. And in fact, Southeast Europe, which is the Balkan Peninsula, where, um, let's see, places like modern day Serbia are, and uh, Greece, which is at the very bottom of that Balkan Peninsula, they both revolt in the 1800s to achieve independence based on their own national identities. And I'd like you to jot a note to the side of that and just note that um, those national identities are in many ways bound up in being uh, Christian, whereas the Ottoman Empire, of course, is um, predominantly um, Islamic. So um, the Ottoman Empire will see what's happening and they will attempt top-down reforms. So the government from the top will try to uh, create some reforms, but it will constantly hesitate because every time it makes a reform, it causes this inevitable political unrest because some people will dislike the new changes and some people will want those changes to go further. They're also going to lose territory to the Austrian Empire, to Russia, who of course wants more water ports, as always, Britain and France. And I'd like you to jot out to the side of that um, the Crimean War in the 1850s. Crimean is C-R-I-M-E-A-N. Crimean War, and this is in the 1850s. This is one of the first really modern global wars, um, and um, <clears throat> Russia will attempt to take over this uh, Crimean Peninsula, which is in the Black Sea, um, and Britain will actually support the Ottomans and do a blocking move because they fear um, the uh, sort of uh, southern push of the Russian Empire and how it might interfere with their ability to um, access uh, various colonies of their own. Um, so. That's one of the biggest um, uh, wars that the Ottoman Empire will fight, um, but they'll sort of be picked off little by little. Um, and uh, if they don't, in fact, lose their territory, they sort of lose sovereignty or control of the territory. So there will be areas where um, technically they still own it, but uh, a different power or a local power is actually in control of that area. And in this map, you can sort of see um, the territory that has been lost. So by 1914, see this stuff that's in kind of this pinky orange red? Um, by 1914, that's all that's left of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, all this stuff that's in purple is what used to be the Ottoman Empire. Okay, so you can see here's Southeast Europe, uh, Bosnia, Serbia, Albania, Montenegro, all those areas will become independent. Here's Greece. They will lose that very early on. Romania, again, all these areas over here have um, large Christian populations, and they'll sort of use that identity as Christians as a unifying ideology to break away um, from uh, Ottoman rule. So, um, and a lot of these areas are, you know, still in dispute today. Oh, just for interest's sake, this little bit right here hanging down into the Black Sea, that is the Crimean 
uh, Peninsula. All right, we're going to take Egypt as a case study of uh, a group that breaks away from the Ottoman Empire and then attempts to uh, nationalize. Egypt is actually invaded by Napoleon, um, so we're going back in history just a little bit. Um, in 1798, the French, uh, under the leadership of Napoleon, invade Egypt to threaten British shipping and trade routes to India. And hopefully we understand by now that by 1798, Britain is full, fully uh, committed and into the Industrial Revolution, and they need those sources of Indian cotton. So the French invade Egypt because it threatens uh, Britain's ability to uh, move easily to and from uh, India to get cotton. And the Egyptian Empire, of course, was, just like the other areas, part of the Ottoman Empire, but it won't really be for long. So we're going to talk about this guy, actually, right here, Muhammad Ali. And, of course, that's a really easy name to uh, remember. And the question is, of course, which Muhammad Ali will win. But um, we'll be talking about this one, not the boxer. All right, Muhammad Ali is going to take control of Egypt. Um, nationalism will spike when Egypt realizes that they are very weak and that the central government, and this is the important part, the central government of the Ottoman Empire is unable to effectively respond to invasion by the French. The French move into Egypt and uh, the Ottoman central government really does not have a response at all, let alone a, an effective uh, military response. So that power vacuum, that realization that the central government uh, is not able to defend or support them, allows Muhammad Ali who was the Ottoman military commander to consolidate and take power for himself. And um, with that realization that they're very weak, they begin to um, conduct some reforms. So Egypt's pride was very wounded. They wanted to prevent further loss of power to Europe. So the logical response is to make use of all those European techniques that allowed them to take over Egypt. And uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, again, depicted on the right, a little bit like Santa there, um, is going to focus on military modernization, industrializing the military, making the military a modern industrialized force. And in order to pay for military modernization, Muhammad Ali will um, direct peasants to produce cotton for export. So, of course, we know that Britain needs cotton. Egypt, um, Egypt I mean, you can still go to like Bed Bath & Beyond and see Egyptian cotton sheets, right? This is the era when uh, Egypt begins to be a primary cotton exporter, uh, and they use that exportation of cotton to pay for this massive overhaul of their military. And, of course, um, his goal is to achieve modernization for Europe, or sorry, for Egypt. Okay, but this, of course, does not just involve chilling on the couch in your slippers. He's going to need to westernize his military. In order to have a modern westernized military, he will have to have western style schools. So, for example, military academies, uh, medical schools, which began as, of course, a way to um, treat troops uh, wounded in battle um, and also to keep them healthy so that they can fight. Educated Egyptians. So Egyptians who, um, for example, can study um, German or study English, replace the old ruling elites. For example, and this is very important, especially um, religious elites. So it used to be in the past that uh, the most educated and respected members of uh, these communities would be, uh, for example, um, the ulama, like uh, people who study and uh, understand the Quran. Um, but that importance begins to fade under this huge stress on modern, uh, modernizing and westernizing the military. But Muhammad Ali will open the world's, uh, the um, Islamic world's first newspaper in 1824, and he'll um, try to open some factories. Of course, guys, I hope you understand that this is going to be enormously, enormously, enormously expensive. And that's when things begin to fall apart. In the 1870s, um, and this is after the death of Muhammad Ali, but in the 1870s, the cotton market uh, collapses. Um, it collapses incidentally because the U.S. Civil War ended and the South comes back on the scene um, making a lot of cotton. And um, of course we know supply and demand, right? So supply increases and um, of course the price of that commodity drops. So Egypt, which is uh, expending huge amounts of money, um, will be unable to finance its debt. So they've borrowed money from Britain. They borrowed money from France to make these improvements. And Britain and France view this as an awesome opening 
to move into Egypt, occupy and control that territory in order to, quote, protect their investments. So um, Egypt has been borrowing a lot of money. They're unable to pay the interest on their debt loans once the uh, price of cotton drops. And that's when Britain and France um, move in and take over Egypt. All right. So that is sort of a case study of one area of the Ottoman Empire that breaks away. Let's move back to the Ottoman Empire as a whole itself. Um, we're going to go through a couple different parts of reform. Um, there are two rulers that are important, so uh, put a star beside their names. So when the third and Muhammad the second, they're going to attempt, attempt to reform uh, mostly the military. Um, and uh, Mahmud the second is going to go further, actually. In that desire to reform the military. Of course, the Janissaries, which are the military elites, they oppose these new changes because it threatens their power. Um, if you are an old style Janissary, then you um, have a lot of special powers and privileges that other uh, members of the population don't have. And if you become outdated, and if you get replaced by a modernized military, that is going to threaten your position in society and threaten your power. They actually overthrow Selim III. Mahmud II realizes um, that he's going to need to get rid of the Janissaries if he's going to move forward in, uh, in terms of modernization. And what he ends up doing, he actually, uh, what we think anyway, he sort of uh, instigates a um, uprising of the Janissaries against himself, and then he um, forms a new military and turns them against the Janissaries. And uh, most of the Janissaries are slaughtered, uh, and their barracks are um, bombarded with artillery and are burned down. Here's the deal. Reform causes complications. Some people who have had power in the past or who have had elite positions in the past are going to be threatened by this change and they're not going to want it to happen. So please um, note to yourself, perhaps right beside where it says reform causes complications, please note that old elites might fight changes. Old elites might fight changes. And that's definitely something that occurs not just in the Ottoman Empire, but also um, in China, also in Japan, um, also in other areas that begin to modernize. Um, the second part of these reforms are called the Tanzimat reforms. And these um, start around 1839. Um, and this is the push of Mahmud II. He wants more drastic reforms after the Janissaries are um, dissolved, aka killed off, and he wants to westernize the military, he wants to westernize education, and um, create a more modern uh, government structure and bureaucracy. And what, in fact, that will end up doing is reducing the um, power of religious leaders and um, Sharia law, that traditional Islamic law. And that, of course, will cause some people who, um, who have their status bound up in those areas or who are very religious to fight against those changes. He'll also encourage what's called Ottomanization, Ottoman, sorry, Ottomanization, which um, is to take that huge empire, which has all sorts of different ethnic groups and all sorts of different um, linguistic groups, for example, Arabs and Arabic, and they will try to um, make those smaller ethnic groups within the empire like the dominant Turkic one uh, that the Ottoman rulers have. So example, uh, for example, they're going to encourage everyone to um, speak Turkic. Now, this is a sort of elite movement within the Ottoman Empire. It isn't something that sort of uh, springs up from the bottom, like a grassroots movement that spreads toward the top. So it's not going to have as much success as something that um, is sort of spontaneously springing up from the bottom um, by uh, the normal people. So um, opposition to this uh, reform movement is pretty significant. Um, and the other problem with that is that some people will want to go further um, and make even greater reforms. And we'll talk about that group in just a second. And the Fez will actually become the symbol of this reform, but it's not that one or this little one that I found for a dog. It's uh, a fez is just a brimless cap, and um, it becomes a symbol of reform within the Ottoman Empire because the Janissaries wore these ridiculous, like, um, <coughs> sorry, super complicated hats with like feathers and all this stuff all over it. But if you're going to be a modern military, you can't have that crazy hat because it will catch on fire and um, burn your face off. So 
what they do is adopt the fez, but it's definitely an Islamic hat. Because hopefully um, in our discussions of um, Islam, you remember that um, prayer is one of the five pillars. And uh, as a part of the ritual of prayer, the forehead has to come down and touch the ground. So it's brimless, so you can still conduct prayers easily. Um, and it's definitely a symbol of reform. And it's a nice, I think, example of Ottoman reform because they don't necessarily want to ditch all of their culture and all of their heritage and their religious background. They just want to not be pushed around by European industrialized powers. All right, again, two problems with reform. Some think reforms go too far, conservative. So um, in the case of the um, Ottoman Empire, especially religious conservatives, and some think that it does not go far enough. And I'd like you to double star or draw a little llama beside the Young Turks. The Young Turk movement wants a fully constitutionalized government. They actually want to get rid of the Sultanate. And they push for more, even more Ottoman, Ottomanization. Um, and again, they push more for the Turkish language. And this will alienate um, most Arabs within the empire uh, who are proud of their own ethnicity and their own Arabic language. And again, those large multilingual, multi-ethnic, multi-religious empires are going to struggle to keep themselves together in an era when uh, national identity is increasingly important and people who have a specific national identity want to break off from these empires and form their own nation states. Um, very briefly, we're going to talk about China. Now, in class, we're actually going to be covering and um, comparing and contrasting China and Japan throughout the week. We'll be looking at documents, creating a timeline, etc. So I'm going to move really briefly through this. Um, and it should be familiar from the summer reading um, as well. So the Opium Wars with Britain of the 1830s and 40s shocked China's government and people. And China was forced, um, we can see actually, this is a famous naval battle when um, most of the Chinese imperial fleet was destroyed in a, a single battle against the modern British um, gunboats of the Industrial Revolution. And they were forced to sign an unequal treaty. And I want you to put a giant star beside that term, unequal treaty. This is a really important term. It refers specifically to treaties signed by Asian nations with European powers that allowed European powers to exploit those Asian nations. So please jot that definition out to the side of the unequal treaty. There are treaties signed between um, Asian nations and European nations, allowing the European nations to exploit the Asian one. Um, this treaty was called the Treaty of Nanjing. It was signed by China. Um, I mean, signed. They didn't really have a choice in the option. They had just been completely militarily obliter obliterated. So um, they were forced to open trade beyond that port of Canton, and they were forced to um, open up to uh, the drug dealing trade of opium. Now, China, this is a huge blow. We understand that um, China's uh, concept of itself in that era of uh, dynastic China is really wrapped up in the idea of it being the Middle Kingdom and people coming and giving tribute to China. And there will be a huge amount of unrest, both the Taiping uh, Rebellion in the 1860s and then the Boxer Rebellion in um, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, hopefully you got some good notes down or will get some good notes down about this rebellion in your um, Strayer reading. I asked a specific question about the Taiping Rebellion and uh, it has a really interesting background. So pay attention when you get to that if you have not yet gotten to it in your um, Strayer reading. China is going to be carved up like a melon. That's sort of the traditional phrase. Um, and it is going to be carved up like you slice up a watermelon into spheres of influence that are economically exploited by various European nations, um, as well as uh, Japan. And oops, I apologize. We all add and Japan onto that. So Britain, France, Russia, and Japan. And we'll talk about Japan in just a second, how they actually get to exploit China, which traditionally has been the power in Asia. There are movements for reform, especially after the Taiping Rebellion. Um, one of the most um, prominent ones is called self-strengthening. We'll talk about that in class. It focuses heavily on military reforms and not losing um, the cultural identity of China. And um, finally, the imperial style government of the Qing Dynasty will be overthrown by nationalists in 1911. And a full century of serious upheaval and craziness will ensue um, throughout the 1900s in China. Okay, um, 
Contrasting that picture of China's navy getting totally obliterated, we've got here um, an example of Japan in the opposite um, rule, actually um, having an effective military force. It doesn't start off that way, though. In 1853, the Tokugawa shogunate is still in power. They were isolated, as we hopefully remember. Um, but their government was forced to open, actually by the United States. Um, the United States was looking for what were called coaling stations, aka areas where their naval ships that were powered with uh, steam engines uh, powered by coal could stop and uh, reload the coal. Obviously, coal is like huge and bulky. And if you want to steamship around the globe, you're going to have to have places where you stop off to get more coal. And the U.S. wanted to open up Japan not only to trade and um, to become a market for their manufactured goods, but they also wanted coaling stations. And they forced Japan to sign another unequal treaty. This one is called the Treaty of Kanagawa. So put a little llama beside it or a few underlines. And this is going to be a huge spark for change in Japan. But Japan, which is not really, um, at least... Uh, in this era, not really, uh, it doesn't have very many different um, ethnic groups or linguistic groups within it. Uh, it's going to have a lot easier time uh, pulling itself together and making the necessary ref reforms so that they don't get steamrolled by uh, Western European nations. In 1868, they will um, overthrow the Tokugawa shogunate and um, reformers will win control of the government. They'll push full modernization, so this will stem even into uh, cultural aspects, and they will, quote, restore the Meiji Emperor to power, although the Meiji Emperor is an important figure who is actually um, uh, worshipped as a, um, a deity during this era um, as a way to sort of like pull everybody together as a nation. Uh, he won't actually have um, all of the power. The power will sort of be held by a small cadre of um, of the um, Meiji uh, Restoration leaders. In 1895, um, Japan will show off its um, new westernized power and military by going to war against um, China in the Sino-Japanese War. And that term Sino always refers to, it's sort of the Latinized version of the word China. So the Sino-Japanese War tips the balance of power in Japan's side. This was a crazy thing. China had always been the number one power in East Asia and really Asia in general, and all of a sudden, uh, Japan is able to beat them in a war. In 1905, Japan will go to war against Russia, and um, they will um, blow up, for, for lack of a better word, uh, Russia's navy uh, at Port Arthur. And um, this will be the first time that um, a, a nation outside of Europe in the era of industrialization will beat a European nation. And this really causes the globe to sit up and take notice of Japan. So we'll, again, be contrasting and comparing those uh, two nations specifically throughout the week. So I'll leave um, that at that. I do want you to understand, though, that the reforms of the Meiji era are not just military. They are very comprehensive. So what you've got is um, modern banking. They redistribute land uh, from feudal lords to um, various members of the population to get them sort of like on board. They get rid of the feudal system. They model their army off of the Prussian, which later becomes Germany army. They build a modern navy to um, emulate the British navy. Their written constitution and um, the government, which is uh, parliamentary, um, will... Uh, be very closely modern, uh, modeled on the German version. Uh, they'll have human rights declared, religious freedom, all this kind of stuff. So it's very comprehensive. So that's what we've got for today. Um, please make sure that you um, are carefully reading Schreer. Um, I think that these specific um, issues are hugely important and uh, very much um, open for um, an essay on the AP exam. So um, be reading Schreer and um, we'll talk about these things, of course, over the course of the week.